Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Karton Karamitas. Or Harris for short. My nickname is Kuku, so some people may already know me because I've been nursing too much lately. Uh, we're going to talk about BNF based black hole fuzzing. So if you can set the title, uh, I'm going to define it word by word. Uh, before I start, uh, any people in this room, are there any people in this room who don't know what fuzzer is? Okay, that's cool. I'm going to skip the table of contents. Uh, some words about me. I'm an undergraduate student at the Record Department, uh, uh, department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. I've been working as a part-time system administrator at the same department since 2007. Uh, I'm interested in static analysis, mathematics, compilers, and reverse engineering. I enjoy source code, source code auditing, uh, and I'm currently working on a project called OpenSAT. OpenSAT is actually a framework uh, for doing automatic static analysis on C code. Uh, it's still in development. And you can uh, contact me at hukuwatjihak.net. I love people with cool ideas. Uh, so what's BNF? BNF is actually a formal notation for defining the syntax of a programming language. I would like to stress the fact that uh, BNF is only about syntax, not the semantics of a programming language. But the term black box uh, is very often used in a system modeling simulation. Um, it indicates that an observer, an outside observer, doesn't have any knowledge on the internal workings of uh, the target system. Of course, you all know what fuzzing is, so fuzzing is the process of automatically producing data uh, that is very highly likely to cause segmentation faults or undefined behavior. Uh, fuzzing is not a substitute for static analysis or other techniques, so if you are a penetration tester, start up your fuzzer, let it work, and then fire up Pita Pro and start your base engineering or do some box analysis. Uh, this presentation actually uh, the first one uh, in a series of presentations that I'll be giving uh, on automatic uh, vulnerability discovery, so stay tuned. Okay, uh, some truths about fuzzers. Um, no offense, but uh, it's a hell of an easy thing to code a fuzzer. So if you code a fuzzer, a fuzzer if you have coded a fuzzer, then uh, no offense, okay. Um, there's a wide variety of fuzzers available, and uh, more and more fuzzers are actually developed day by day, but unfortunately, they compete in uh, features uh, rather than uh, in techniques. So the same ideas are actually being implemented again and again. Uh, this talk uh, will present a new uh, fuzzing architecture, not just a new fuzzer. Um, I assume that you already know how a fuzzer works. Let's start by some mathematical prerequisites. Uh, a set. a set is actually a collection of objects. Uh, this definition was given by Cantor. I guess you all know Cantor. But uh, it's a more philosophical definition rather than a mathematical one. Uh, so I will skip it. Okay, an alphabet. An alphabet is actually a non empty and finite set of symbols. Uh, and the alphabets are usually represented by the Greek sigma letter. Uh, okay, an alphabet is actually. Uh, is the equivalent in mathematical logic? An alphabet is uh, 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 exactly the equivalent of an alphabet of, of a natural language. So, uh, in this example, I define sigma is equal uh, to a set that contains uh, the letters A and B. Uh, okay, in English, uh, the alphabet contains the letters A to Z. Uh, a set uh, does not necessarily consist of numbers, so keep that in mind. We will later see that uh, there are certain sets that contain roots. A string. Uh, the term string is very often used uh, among uh, developers, okay? But let's define what a string is in a formal notation. A string is actually a finished sequence of characters uh, from sigma. So, uh, in the previous example, sigma uh, uh, equals a comma b. Uh, then, this string, w, is actually a string over sigma. Uh, the phrase is a string over something uh, indicates that uh, this string can be produced by um, the alphabet. Uh, the cleaning closer. Uh, the cleaning closer is a very cool thing, actually. I guess uh, everyone already knows what the, what the cleaning closer is. Um, the cleaning closer is a set of all possible strings that can be produced over uh, an alphabet. Um, okay, a formal language. Um, assume that uh, we have calculated the cleaning closer of uh, a given alphabet. And then any subset, any subset uh, of uh, the clean closure is actually a language. Um, do all these definitions ring a bell? 
Anyone? Um, regular expressions? Uh, these are the definitions uh, that actually form the basis of uh, regular expressions. Okay, before I continue with the, the, the definition of a grammar, uh, let's try to think what a formal language is. Um, uh, consider the uh, English alphabet. Uh, using the English alphabet, we can actually construct uh, various words. Okay, so uh, the word hello is a valid English word. Uh, but the word ASDF is not a valid one. So uh, the English uh, language is actually a subset of all the possible words that can be generated from the English alphabet. Well, uh, so if you uh, someday you grab a dictionary um, and you learn it by heart, then okay, you know all the possible words of the English language, but you can't speak English. That's because you don't you can you don't know the, you don't you don't know the rules uh, that can be used to construct valid English sentences. So that's ex exactly what uh, a grammar uh, is capable of. Uh, it actually contains a set of rules for producing all the strings, all the valid strings of a language. Okay, but the G of L is actually mathematical notation for, for a set, for an alphabet, for a grammar, I'm sorry. Um, BNF, or Bacchus-Dorf form, is actually a special kind of uh, grammar used to describe uh, a so-called set of context-free languages. Uh, I, I don't want to get into de details, so if anyone was interested, then uh, can sub with me later. We can talk about it. Uh, BNF was named after John Bacchus and Peter Naur. And it was also standardized by ISO and renamed to EPNF. And it was also standardized by IES and renamed to APNF. Um, any guys that have used JAK at least once before? Okay, just two guys. I love you. Um, the rules given in a .y file actually uh, compose a PNF grammar. Okay, that's a very uh, trivial BNF example. Um, don't try to understand the rules uh, yet. Um, this BNF example consists of uh, four uh, rules. The first rule is called the start. Okay, so uh, a number, the, the, the first, rules, uh, first rule indicates that a number is equal to a sign followed by more digits. We use rule number three. So a number, so the sign is replaced by minus and a number equals minus followed by more digits. Then we replace by using uh, rule number two uh, the digits with a digit followed by more digits. By more digits. This is the rule that we used. We used actually the second half of the rule which is uh, it, it's called the second production of the second rule. So uh, rules are separated uh, into uh, productions uh, using the pipe character. And then we use uh, rule number two once again, and a number equals a minus followed by a digit followed by one more digit. We replace the first occurrence of digit with a one, and then with a zero. Number sign digit digits are called non-terminals or variables. Um, this is because uh, these uh, these are actually placeholders. Okay, they are just used to define the syntax of uh, the produced string. Uh, the rest of the symbols are called terminals or tokens because they're actually the symbols that compose the final uh, string that is produced over this uh, grammar. Okay, uh, rules two and three consist of two production sheets and rule four consists of ten productions. Okay, if we visualize all this process of generating a string over a grammar, uh, we come up with a so-called parse string for our string. Okay. Okay, PNF uh, grammars can be used to define the structure of network protocols, especially uh, the plain uh, text ones, uh, file formats, and programming languages, and of course, many more. You can Google uh, for existing PNF grammars. Uh, for example, grab, a, grab your favorite uh, RFC, and it contains for sure a PNF grammar of the protocol in question. For example, this grammar is a very limited uh, is a very, uh, grammar that describes a very limited subset of the HTTP protocol. Okay, um, uh, uh, an HTTP request consists of uh, a verb followed by a slash, that the string HTTP slash one point one and so on, blah blah blah. 
Okay, um, uh, I'm going to introduce you to LibBNF. LibBNF is actually a tiny C library uh, that was initially developed as part of my uh, primary project called OpenSAT. It's actually responsible for parsing a BNF file that contains uh, the definition of a BNF grammar. You can download it from this location. Okay, this is uh, relevant uh, for uh, uh, only for C programmers. Uh, BNF, uh, the LibBNF library exports a user-friendly API for uh, handling BNF grammars. I don't want to get into detail because uh, I don't have much time. Okay, let's see. Um, LibBNF is capable of uh, receiving the BNF grammar and visualizing. This is how our grammar looks like, okay? A sign equals a minus or a plus. A digit is either 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. And uh, notice the, the different colors of the arrows. Uh, each color indicates one rule. So uh, the, the digits um, consist of a digit and followed by more digits, or just of one digit. Okay, so in the previous example, we produce a string, uh, a string minus 10. Well, it's actually a number, but okay, it's a string consist that consists of numbers, okay? Um, uh, we used an iterative process uh, during which we actually replaced its non-terminal by one of its productions. Well, uh, in real life situations, uh, this algorithm is very naive and cannot produce any valid results. Uh, because of two reasons. Uh, first, the process is not, is not guaranteed to end because recursive relations uh, between non-terminals are very common and actually uh, they are very helpful for uh, a programmer. And the produced sentences are not uniformly distributed. Um, certain sentences have a high probability of being produced by the grammar. We want uh, an algorithm that will be able to produce uh, all the sentences of uh, grammar. Well, hopefully, better libraries exist. Uh, for our tool, for our proof of concept tool, uh, we implemented uh, an algorithm presented in uh, generating strings and random from a context free grammar by Bruce McKenzie. And of course, we implemented the naive algorithm just for fun. Okay, let's see how these things look like in real life. Okay, so, um, okay, this is how um, the example grammar of the previous slides uh, look like, looks like in uh, a BNF format. And uh, here is the output produced by uh, BNF Fuzz. BNF Fuzz is actually the proof of concept code. Uh, the, the tool that we use for fuzzing using BNF grammars. Uh, here is the first sentence that was generated. It's actually a plus followed by more digits. Okay, so uh, we just uh, seen a way of uh, producing strings of our BNF grammar, so this is not help helpful, right? We can't do anything with it. Uh, we have to somehow embed fuzzing primitives in our uh, BNF grammar. Fuzzing primitives are methods of defining the semantics of the fuzzer, how the fuzzer is supposed to act uh, based on the user's appetite. So, um, here's how uh, BNF uh, grammar with embedded uh, uh, fuzzing primitives looks like. Uh, a sign equals uh, plus or minus, but we indicate that either the plus or the minus symbol is static information, so it's not going to be mutated during the fuzzing uh, session. On the contrary, uh, the digits are declared to be integers, integers, and so they are fuzzed as such. The non-terminals of our grammar is responsible for producing uh, syntactically correct sentences. And the terminals uh, form actually a, a basis of uh, the fuzzing primitives. Uh, a fuzzer will receive the produced sentence, will parse the fuzzing primitives, 
and will understand how it's supposed to act based on them. So, uh, let's see how a real-life uh, BNF grammar of, an HT of HTTP looks like with embedded primitives. Okay, this is the debugging output. Don't freak out. The algorithm is pretty uh, complex. Okay, so this part is actually a standard HTTP request. But uh, for each part of this request, we have assigned uh, assigned uh, uh, certain data type. Now, think uh, that uh, um, our father will actually receive uh, this output and uh, will assign the static data type to the verb get, the static data type to the slash, and so on. Okay, so um, we're actually uh, researching uh, a new fuzzing framework uh, that will not depend on any uh, of the existing ones. Uh, but since we are still researching stuff, um, we need a fuzzing framework that will do the hard work of actually producing um, the output. There are several choices. Uh, Sally by Peter Mamini, uh, Peach Fuzzer, Spike, Fuzzled, and many, many more special purpose uh, fuzzers. For the sake of this presentation, I decided to use Sally, uh, which is called in Python, and it's a good choice for fast development. Well, unfortunately, Sally is not actively maintained. I don't know why. Uh, but uh, our casting fuzzing framework uh, is under research. OK, so let's see how a trivial fuzzer looks like in uh, Sally. Uh, has, anyone, has anyone ever used Sally in this uh, room? Okay, one guy, and one more. <laughs> um, okay, Sally is actually a block-based generative fuzzer. Um, it finds some, uh, it finds some uh, logical blocks that uh, compose uh, a string. Uh, in this situation, um, a, 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 we declare a group called verbs. Verbs is, a, is just a string, and this group uh, contains the values get, head, post, options, and so on. Then we start a block, a logical block of data. And we assign um, the group verbs to this block. Uh, so this block of data starts with one of these uh, verbs. Then uh, a white space follows, which is declared as a delimiter. A slash, which is also declared as a delimiter. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, so uh, each one of these function calls um, attach a certain data type to one of the given strings. So uh, the white space is declared to be a delimiter, and so it is fast. It is fast as such later in the fuzzing process. Uh, the string index HTML uh, is declared to be a string, uh, and uh, these uh, function calls actually uh, tell uh, Sally uh, to use um, a, a table of pre-computed pre uh, strings that are iteratively replaced. Um, this uh, index HTML is actually replaced by one of these uh, strings. We will see an example later. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, the request generated by one of the of the rules at the top. Okay, this is how uh, this is uh, the data produced by a fuzzing session. Uh, as you can see, we declared uh, white space to be a delimiter, and so Sally thought that hey, I can repeat this delimiter a few times, and maybe the target location will cross. And this process is uh, repeated again and again, and we end up with some cool requests. Okay, like. Uh, this one, okay, this is pretty cool. And this one as well. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, so let me introduce you to PNF fuzz. PNF fuzz is our PNF based fuzzer. It requires a PNF grammar with embedding uh, embedded uh, fuzzing primitives. It supports algorithms for producing strings over a given PNF grammar, uh, the naive algorithm, and then Macasey algorithm. And it's still a concept, so don't expect uh, many features because uh, it's still under research. But it works fine. Um, you can see the to do list for what's to come. Okay, uh, this, slide describe, this slide describes uh, how PNF fast works in real life. Uh, I'm going to skip it and I will show you this picture. Okay, so uh, PNF fast is coded in Python. PNF fast loads uh, Sally, which is actually a, a, a Python library. libpnf is coded in C. libpnf is responsible for parsing the PNF file. Okay, since uh, libpnf is coded in C and bnf fuzz in Python, we have to find a way uh, to somehow load the libpnf uh, DLL uh, within the Python uh, code. Uh, this can be achieved by using the uh, foreign function interface of Python. It's a mechanism for uh, loading uh, binary objects compiled uh, from another compiler in uh, Python. Okay, then bnf fuzz will call certain uh, libpnf functions, will uh, um, produce a string from the given BNF grammar, and then we'll use Sally to uh, attach these data types to uh, produce sentence, and the fuzzing starts. Data is sent to an application, which is usually attached to a Windows debugger. Okay, Sally comes with a bunch of tools that monitor the target uh, application, whether it crashes or not. So if it crashes, uh, it, a message is sent back to the fuzzer indicating that, uh, you know, uh, this application crashed at this location, uh, so you can reproduce and code, reproduce the bug in the code and export of your own. Uh, well, for some reason, I don't know why, uh, I couldn't make them work. After 10 or 20 minutes of fuzzing, uh, the process, the Procmon process that ends perfectly. Procmon is actually uh, one component of Sally that uh, monitors the, uh, the process that is being fuzzed. Well, I don't know why this happened, so I didn't have time to investigate it further. So I used to, uh, I decided uh, to use uh, the WinDBC debugger. I used this uh, command. Uh, well, this command uh, runs the, uh, the CDB, the console version of uh, the Windows debugger, and attaches to the target executable. And the, the output is sent to a file called CDB target.log. Well, uh, I repeat this process for uh, this count of times. Okay, so if the target application, the target application crashes more than uh, this amount, then it's obvious that we should stop fuzzing, okay, because it's probably a dream. Uh, for Unix-based operating systems, you can use uh, either GNU GDB or ARC's E2DBG, and these are the, the appropriate commands for both of these 